Hey everybody, this is Jake Maxey with Anthony Realtors and welcome to another episode of the Fort Wayne Local Podcast. I'm very excited. I got Jimmy Schindler with me today. Uh, he's the owner of Bandito's and Guadalupe's Mexican Grill. He's the son of Fort Wayne famous restaurateur Jimmy Schindler. Uh, he's married with four children, uh, undergrad at Notre Dame, uh, and then went on, got a little, stepped up his game and ended up going to Purdue uh, for grad school. Um, took over Bandito's in 2013. They have four locations, three are here in Fort Wayne, one's in Lima, Ohio. And in December of 2019, started a new concept with Guadalupe's, and it was a smash hit before we got uh, thrown off course here by coronavirus. Um, his mother, Fry, is my godmother and one of the kindest, most caring people I know, and maybe maybe one of the most well-known people in town, honestly. <laughs> right. Uh, but uh, Jimmy, thanks for joining us today. No problem. Happy to be here. Absolutely. So the, re the reason I wanted to talk to you was, uh, you know, restaurant owners, as everyone knows and everyone sees, they're going through a lot right now. And I wanted to, you know, get it straight from the source and hear kind of, you know, everything you're dealing with, how you're mm -hmm. trying to work through it, um, Absolutely. how you, you stay positive, which I know is something that's really important to you is a constant positive attitude. Um, so let's start right back when it started. Take us through your first reaction uh, when everything began shutting down and, you know, what was going through your mind? What was your emotions? What were you considering doing? Well, at first, I think it was like most business owners, it was kind of surreal and it, it didn't really register. I remember when it started coming down the, the pipe and, and things started shutting down, I even told my, my team, I just said, oh, don't worry about this. We'll be open in a couple of weeks. Uh, you know, and so we thought we'd be open beginning of April, mid-April. And so as we kind of went through it and then it just kind of ramped up, up and up, it became apparent that it was, it was quite a bit more serious than anything we've ever seen in our lifetimes. And, uh, you know, that brought a whole different set of, of challenges and um, brought us to the point that we're at today. So. Sure. And, and so speaking of your employees, have you taken advantage of any of the government programs, the paycheck protection program or the SBA loans or any of that? Absolutely. We're continually monitoring the situation. We did get the PPP loan. Uh, unfortunately, there's a there's a bunch of challenges with using that as a restaurant, especially a restaurant that was shut down for t for two months um, with the, the full time equivalent hurdles and those sorts of things. So we did get it. It's kind of a mixed bag. It may or may not help depending on how the final um, clarifications come out from the FBA, SBA and the Treasury. So, uh, yeah, we did take we did take advantage of that and we just reopened the restaurants on May 8th for to go and uh, yesterday Monday for 50% capacity per the governor's order. That's great and so why did you decide to shut down? Why did you not go to a carryout only? Mm -hmm. um, I, the biggest thing is I ran just pro formas and looked at it and I, I realized very quickly that this was going to be a really really serious deal and there'd be a lot of decreased traffic flow because of people who are rather compromised immune systems or they're just scared plus the government regulation i didn't i didn't know it was going to happen are they going to shut the state completely down and the restaurant business is a very very low margin business i mean you see it in movies and it's it's glorified and people say i'm going to retire and open a restaurant but it's one of the lowest margin margin hard high labor businesses that you could be in i mean the average full service restaurant makes three to five percent profit on a good day. So if you spend a hundred bucks, I'd be lucky to make five. And so when I just looked at it, I said, man, if our sales drop 10%, let alone 50% or 75%, I just felt like my job was not to um, stay open in the short term. It was to preserve the company and our employees jobs for the long term. So I just felt like that was the best decision to make at the time to be able to reopen and, um, continue to serve the, the Fort Wayne community for another 40 years. I mean, this is our 40th year anniversary. So um, again, my job is always to preserve our employees jobs at all costs and preserve the business because a lot of people depend, depend on us and depend on our decisions. Sure. And you know, that was also why I wanted to talk to you was to show people what you're going through and the challenges that you're facing. Cause you know, we laughed the other day about how everyone has this image of, you know, the fat cat owner who's just sitting back <laughs> and counting his money. And it's like, you know, you're waking up every day grinding, trying to figure out how you're going to keep this thing moving forward, especially mm -hmm. with all this uncertainty. So, and when you did decide to shut down, like you obviously had a lot of food and supplies. What did you end up doing with all that food? 
Yeah. So what we did is, as you know, we do, we cut our own produce. We do almost everything from scratch in house. I mean, it's like your grandma or your mom would cook it, right? Or yourself if you're a chef, but we do, we did, we, we couldn't, you can't freeze fresh produce and those sorts of things. So we ended up giving it to our employees as everybody went on to furlough. We decided to just, Hey, take the cheese and the meats and let's uh, send it out to, to our, our employees versus just trying to save it or, you know, you know having to throw it away because it goes bad. And so it was just kind of a nice thing when it happens, like, Hey, we're closing down. We don't know how long it's going to be, but at least here's some food. And our employees were really appreciative of that. Um, at least that's what they, you know, they told me and seemed very, very happy. I mean, obviously we tens of thousands of dollars of food we had to replace to reopen, uh, not to mention escalating beef prices, hard to find some beef in paper prices. So, you know, it's just kind of been, it's been a whirlwind of emotions between helping people and trying to get open and all those sorts of things. Sure. And, and then you kind of referenced some of the challenges with the, the PPP and, and just, you know, jumping through those hurdles. If you, if you had control or if you had someone's ear in government, what would you have recommended that they could do differently that would have been beneficial to you guys? Well, it seems to me the PPP is set up for businesses that are up and running and really doing well right now. I mean, if you, if you got the PPP money and your business is strong through this time, it's like one in the lottery because you can meet the hurdles, no problem. I mean, the biggest hurdle is the FTE full-time equivalents. And so let's just say I had 100 employees, for example, nice round number. If I only get to 50% of those num of, of the 100, original 100 by the end of the eight weeks, uh, the government's only going to forgive 50% of what they would have forgiven. But, you know, my point is we can't open our dining room. In, in a lot of cases, we're calling people back and they've rather found other jobs or they don't want to come back. And so it's just really, really difficult for, for businesses, not just restaurants who had to shut down and they're trying to reopen and get ramped back up to full by the end of the eight weeks. And we also don't even know what the market's going to be, right? I mean, the market's going to shrink for restaurants. It's just how much, how many people are going to stay at home and not go out to eat anymore. And for how long is it five, 10, 20%? And so if, if I was recommending the government, I would have said, hey, if you're a restaurant, just take the money, spend it on rent, utilities, and, and, and labor. And as long as you can prove that you've spent it on people, rent, utilities, and interest, we're going to forgive it, period, end of discussion. If that was the case, I mean, we would have put people on payroll much earlier. Uh, we would have ramped up probably even sooner. And then moving forward, um, you know, we'd be feel much more comfortable staffing up and and then pat give us maybe a little cushion that we can look at future growth and other things but when you have every restaurant it doesn't matter what your business or you have x amount of cash right and it's just a product of time and, and, and how much sales you have coming in so if you have x amount of cash and you're losing x per week or if you're shut down completely and you're still having to pay your rent property taxes and quarterly estimates it's just a product of time and money right so I just think the PPP could have been much better had they, or and they still might change it, just come in and said, hey, spend on labor this stuff, prove that you spent it, and we'll forgive it. I got you. Yeah, I was talking to uh, Mike Zine, he's the president of uh, First Federal Savings Bank, and he referenced it being like they were building, a, driving a car as they were building it type of thing, and there was so much uncertainty, and it sounds like, you know, just a little more clarity maybe help, would help you be more decisive if, if you knew exactly what the ramifications were going to be. Yeah, and I think the other scary part is there's a lot of restaurateurs who may not fully understand the law or haven't looked into it, and they've spent that money because they thought it meant one thing, and, and, and they've clarified several times and still have many things they got to clarify. You know, my fear is that there's some small business owners who don't maybe understand that. They spend all this money, um, and then the government comes back and says, hey, sorry, we're not going to forgive this now. And then, you know, in December of this year, when they got to start making these payments on a one-and-a-half-year amortization because they have the six-month forgiveness time, they can't make the PPP payments. So, I mean, that's a really serious situation for a small business to be in. Um, and that's my fear, which is people who maybe aren't as connected or haven't checked the actual details of the law. I and mean, it's just, for me, I mean, we, we've read it, we're fine, we're excited about it, but if you don't fully understand it, it's, it's a scary, scary deal. Sure, like some of the more mom and pop type people and stuff like that. Absolutely. You. Mm -hmm. So you referenced that you reopened, um, that's awesome. I'm Best day ever. Get back over there. <laughs> yeah. And uh, so it's kind of taking through your game plan then, you know, now that, now that things are opening, you know, obviously um, you had four locations with Banditos, but mm -hmm. I, with Guadalupe, you guys had so much momentum. Every time I went there, it was packed. And you and I had talked about, you know, if this continues, you know, maybe looking at another location or something mm -hmm. like that. Um, yep. So where are you at right now? Like what's the game plan as we ramp back up? 
there's just so much uncertainty. Anybody who says they have a hard and fast game plan, I think would be lying. But originally we were going to do another Guadalupe's by the end of the year. We're still hoping that happens. I mean, a lot of it just depends what happens over the next few weeks. We've been open. This is day two, right? So Mm -hmm. assuming business gets back to normal, even close to normal. Yeah. I mean, we'd love to, to grow Guadalupe's and and continue to to build on that momentum. I think the biggest hurdle for a lot of small businesses that have been shut down and reopened, and we were shut down for almost two months or two months. So the biggest hurdle, and, and we've been busy in certain stores, is just people have to know that we're open and we rely on the public, people like you, to tell their friends and family and neighbors that we're we're reopened. Uh, we're not McDonald's, like you said earlier, the fat cat restaurant owner, but you know, mm-hmm. small businesses, Bandito's is a locally family owned business. We're not Applebee's, we're not McDonald's. And so we don't have a, a tr- trove of people over here doing social media and this massive marketing firm over here. And so we really, really rely on uh, word of mouth and just social media stuff. So uh, anybody who's listening, I'm not asking you to, to push Bandito's or Guadalupe's, but I am asking you to push any local business that you frequent that you know business owners that you know just take five seconds and give them a review share a page i mean you might not seem like a big deal but it's a huge deal I mean, if you share something and 100 people see them that could really help out it might make the difference and the guy who owns the bicycle shop or the, or the guy who owns the the tool and die shop or whatever i mean you know just i think it can help everybody but if we all help and share together sure I agree. I drive my friends crazy with that. I ask them to share stuff all the time and <laughs> half of them aren't even on Facebook and I still bug them to do it. But so I guess logistically, as you're ramping back up, aside from, you know, trying to figure out what's coming, what are some of the challenges from a food standpoint? I mean, you guys have a, a lot of fresh produce and even if it's, you know, even if it's something that was frozen or something like the meat, you, you still have to budget and plan and with not knowing who's coming, how are you handling the food logistics? Yeah, it's a little bit of a juggling act. We've been pretty pretty lucky. Prices have skyrocketed. Some vendors will say, hey, we're not going to submit pricing in advance. You'll have to see a lot of out of stock. So they'll deliver half your order and then you're scrambling to find it elsewhere. So you're making Kroger runs or you're running to the local marketplace. Uh, so far, we've been able to, to handle it. Um, but you know, the cost escalation, uh, scarcity of certain things, paper products increasing. I mean, it's just, it's, it's a challenge and it puts more pressure frankly, on margins uh, that just aren't there in the restaurant business. So it's a concern moving forward, I think, across the board. I mean, if you've been to a grocery store, you've seen the stuff. You're seeing, like, we don't get food from some magical Fairyland place that it just comes and it's cheap and it's always there. I mean, it's the same place that um, that you would go to, you know, Kroger or wherever, and you you see the shortages of meat and the limited stuff, and you see the escalating prices. I mean, we're seeing, we're seeing the same thing. So I think just the biggest thing I would, again, ask the general public is just be patient. Tip your tip your servers. You know, if someone's out of stock, just try and be understanding. And we're 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 just human beings like everyone else, trying to do the best we can do. And and um, you know, it's a tough situation, but we're trying to stay positive and work through it. You know. Yeah, we had uh, my wife and I got carried out from a local place. I won't say the name because I do like them, but our order came through and it was a disaster. Mm. And you know, at first we were kind of like, you know, what what in the world? But it's like, you know what? they're dealing with challenges like the people that were working there this was especially like right when things were really uncertain with covid and there's a lot of fear out there i'm like they're they're going in there and working like we're just going to have to roll with the punches sometimes and Mm -hmm. maybe not get exactly what we want every time so totally agree with that and you know speaking of the staff have you been having any challenges with employee retention i mean obviously with people on unemployment benefits or is it hard getting people back to work and then you don't want to put them in harm's way, but at the same time, it's like you have a business to run and their job is there. So how do you balance that? Yeah, it's, it's, it's tough. I mean, you just try and treat people like, like human beings and you just try and do the best you can do. It's been, it's been a mixed bag. We've called people back who were upset because maybe they're making more on unemployment. Maybe they're not, I don't know, but they, you know, they don't want to come back to work. But at the same time, like you said, we, we have a business, we have a duty to, our, our employees uh, in their livelihoods to get people back and get back and up and running and to ensure we're going to be here. So we it's just been a mixed bag. Some stores have had almost every employee come back. Some have had half staff come back. Uh, we're just trying to hire people and, and again, just try and treat people like people and just be as nice as you can, be as direct as you can. And unfortunately, some people may may perceive small business owners as the bad guy, like you're calling me back and I don't want to come back or whatever. But we're trying to do the best we can do. We're trying to to be safe. You know, I have to wear this mask all the time. I have it all the time now. So, um, you know, have the mask, have the gloves, sanitize, 
follow the governor's orders to the best of our ability. And, and we all have the same goal. We don't want people sick. We want people to feel safe. We want to have, provide a quality product that's safe for our guests. And so, yeah, it's just like, I mean, it's not rocket science. You just try and treat people as nice. Now you're always going to, it's just like guests. I mean, sometimes you have someone who may or may not be unreasonable or, or an employee who just says, I don't care what you say. I'm not coming back. And if you contest my unemployment, I'm going ballistic. I mean, you just got to do the best you can. I mean, people aren't always going to, you can't control what other people do. You can only control your response, right? So. Definitely. And I feel like if anybody can do it, we know you can. You know, you're a seasoned veteran. You're like, we talked about your optimism. Um, I, I know you'll come through. So uh, I also want to uh, ask, I ask all guests this. I know you love Fort Wayne. Um, what's your favorite thing about living in Fort Wayne? That's a good question. Uh, I always joke that Fort Wayne is the pinnacle of civilization at any time <laughs> in history, past, present, or future. I, I just love it here. I was born and raised here. After I get my my graduate degree at Purdue, I had a chance. I could have gone anywhere in the country. I worked for Domino's corporate headquarters up in Ann Arbor, and I had offers to be a franchisee for other things. And I just love Fort Wayne. I mean, I think it's it's safe. Uh, it's inexpensive to live. There seems to be a sense of community and some, some momentum with a lot of the projects here. A uh, great place to raise kids. I mean, I have I have four very, very young kids. And um, so, yeah, I just, I just love the community and, I, and I've, I've been here and we just try and do the best we can do. And um, I would, re I recommend anybody to come to Fort Wayne because it's just such a great uh, safe and, and tight community. So that's kind of what I like about it. I don't know if that's one specific thing, but you know, no, plus that's, Jake that's, here now. I mean, come on, man, how can you get better than that? Yeah. It, it really can't get any better now. Um, <laughs> and that Dan Westrick's answer was three minutes on why he likes Fort Wayne. So you, you came in a little shorter than him. All but. right. But no, I, I feel the same way. I, I just, I love it here. I couldn't like it anymore. And that's why I'm trying to end every interview with the, with the highlight about that. So, um, well, thanks for your time today. How can people learn more about you? How can they contact you? Do you have any mode of communication you prefer? Yeah, again, we're local people, born and raised here. Like I said, I went to Bishop Lewis High School. So if you have, ever have a problem, you can contact our corporate office at any time, uh, banditos.com, guadalupes.com. Uh, you can order online. You can see what we're all about, what we're trying to accomplish. So, yeah, we're just accessible local people, and we love hearing honest honest feedback, and we hope it's perfect every time. But uh, I learned long ago that I am not a perfect being, and we're going to screw up inevitably. So uh, just let us know. We'll fix it. And we hope, for the most part, it's, it's great, and we appreciate your business, and we appreciate you shopping local, whether it's with us or, or with somebody else. So. That's how. Yeah, sure. And uh, yeah, Jimmy, thanks for your time. I appreciate this. You're a great guy. You come from a great family. Um, I hope everybody gets out there, gets some tacos and burritos now that this thing's loosening up. And, uh, and thanks again. Yeah, thank you so much. Have the best day ever. All right. See ya. See ya. Bye.